for coming back. <laughs> Looks like almost everybody came back. That's uh, reassuring to me. So I've been telling you about the life of the Buddha, and I've been trying to provide some insights along the way to sort of uh, help document this idea that the life of the Buddha itself is his teaching. And you can see, I think, in many ways how it's paradigmatic of what it is that someone on the spiritual path in Buddhism would follow. Someone who realizes that all the things that they have in life or all the things that they think they need are not going to be fulfilling to them. And that uh, there are particular ways to really find an end of suffering. And that's what the Buddha found as he sat under the Bodhi tree at age 35 and began to teach his followers uh, for the rest of his life. What I want to talk to you about uh, now is really the content of that teaching, what he really discovered uh, at that moment of enlightenment, and what he taught to his uh, disciples following uh, that awakening. He had lots of followers, by the way, uh, but you know, Buddhism remained just a very small sect within the larger Hindu tradition for a long time. It's, it's closely parallel to the way uh, Christianity was just part of Judaism for a long time before it began to distinguish. So there are lots of parallels, I think, between Buddhism and Christianity. But it did uh, become a favored tradition when one emperor by the name of Ashoka, who lived in the third century BCE in India, converted to Buddhism in an episode not unlike the way Constantine converted uh, after the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. And that's really kind of what gave Buddhism its international status. In fact, Buddhism is the first international religion. Uh, Ashoka sent missionaries out to different parts of the world because he was so impressed with it. But he never said, this is the only way. Uh, in fact, what happened when Ashoka converted to Buddhism was to issue an edict tolerating all religions. And that is very consistent with Buddhism. The Buddha would never say, you've got to follow this path. This is the only way. Uh, he would say, this is the way I've discovered. Try it out. If it works for you, great. If Christianity is better for you, fine. Uh, the Dalai Lama, in fact, uh, oftentimes tells people, don't change your religion. And in fact, that's what I've discovered too. If you're a Christian, you can find these same kinds of spiritual resources within that tradition. If you study the desert fathers and mothers, what do you call them, Bill? The Abadabas. Yeah, I call them the mamas and the papas. Um, <laughs> you'll find a lot of the same practices right there. A lot of the same insights. And that's why I, I love reading the Desert Fathers and Mothers and, and, and other traditions as well, uh, because you can see this stuff in other places. I just had to kind of leave Christianity and go to another tradition so I could see it in Christianity. It was the oddest sort of thing. As long as I was practicing the tradition, I couldn't quite see it as well as when I had to leave it and then could see it. But it's there. So what it was that the Buddha taught. I told you that he gave his first sermon or discourse lecture uh, to his former disciples at a place called Sarnat in a deer park, very pleasant place to be today. Uh, when they first saw him coming, they were still mad at him. They said, here comes that Siddhartha Gautama. Man, he is such an arrogant SOB. Let's just kind of ignore him. So they promised they were going to ignore him and just pretend like he wasn't there. And then as he approached, he was so serene and so placid and so calm, they could tell that something happened. Um, and so they just started falling all over themselves to welcome him and said, here, please sit here and tell us what you've learned. Changed their attitude completely. And they listened to him talk and uh, they all gained an awakening by listening to him over this period of time, according to the legends, and they became the nucleus of his sangha, of his community. And what I want to talk to you about uh, for the next hour or so uh, is really what he said during that sermon, because we do have it, and it has provided kind of the foundation for understanding the basics of Buddhism. If you can understand this first sermon, I think you've got it. I really do. In fact, uh, 
you might be enlightened uh, if you uh, understand just these four noble truths. The, 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 the problem is, is really understanding them, uh, not just intellectually, but with your heart and living your life. That's the problem with it. Uh, and so I'm going to tell you about what it was that he taught. Uh, that sermon has come down to the tradition to be known as the four noble truths. And I'm going to say uh, something about each one of them. Uh, but I want to begin by this title that is used to talk about it, which is, could be a little bit misleading. Uh, I'm going to start with the word noble, uh, which is the word aria. Uh, you've heard the word arian, right? Arian nation. <laughs> that word means noble. It's a Sanskrit word. Uh, that Adolf Hitler adopted because he was trying to emulate some of the uh, beliefs that he had about this group of people. So Aryan is a word that the Buddha himself knew, and he was an Aryan. The same people who eventually migrated to Germany and to uh, Greece and other parts of Europe also migrated into India. And the Buddha was a descendant of these same groups of people. Now, according to their understanding, an Arya was someone who was born in a certain family. So to be a noble meant to be a member of this race. So it's not unlike the way the Hitler thought about you know, racial superiority. What the Buddha did was to come along and say, no. That's not what nobility is. That's not what it means to be an Aryan. What it means to be an Aryan is to act nobly. It is a matter of your practice. It's a matter of your spirituality, not a matter of your birth. Anybody can be noble if they practice nobility, if they practice this noble spirituality. Now, that was radical. So you, you're probably aware of the, the caste system in India, you know, the four major castes plus the uh, Dalits or the untouchables. And the Buddha was part of this caste system. What he did was radically to basically say there's no conceptual reason for this. There's no philosophical foundation for the caste system. It was an anti-caste movement. Hinduism, on the other hand, kept caste and became more successful. And, uh, and by the way, there, there are hardly any Buddhists left in India today, just as there are hardly any Christians left in Israel. Uh, but it got its start there, and it was at one time the probably preeminent religion. But it was anti-caste, and it was open to women in ways that Hinduism and other traditions were not. So what it meant to be noble was something that was at stake at the time of the Buddha. And that's why he called these the noble truths, because anyone could practice them. And then there's this word truth. That's the other word I want to uh, emphasize here. It's not belief. The Buddha is not giving a doctrine. This is not a creed. He's not saying you've got to believe these sorts of things. The word is satya, which means reality or being. He's saying this is the way it is. These are laws, basically, uh, like the law of gravity, if you want to think of it that way, uh, or anything else that you know to be uh, a fact. This is the way he presented the noble truths. But he didn't say you have to believe this because I said it, or you believe this because it's written in my holy text, or because God said it's true. He said, you check this out for yourself. I'm going to give you these four uh, basic ideas. Look, implement it yourself, and see if this is not true for you. If it's not true for you, fine. Best of luck finding your way. Uh, but if you do follow them, you may see something differently. So that's the way he uh, asked his students to uh, look at these things. He saw them as facts that could be verified by anyone who took the trouble to discover them. Now that is very much akin to modern science. Modern science is very empirical. It says, test this out, look at it, see if it's true. And that's what the Buddha said. Never accept anything on authority, he says, uh, even if it's from me or any teacher or if it's tradition or if it comes from a book or revelation or any of that. He just did not trust it. It's something that has to be lived. So I like to think of these things as the great facts of life rather than the four noble truths or you know, four creeds or whatever you want to call them. Uh, the Buddha presents them as just the way things are, and it's something that he discovered. And here's the first one. It's simple. Life as we know it is suffering. 
That's my translation. All of this is my translation. Um, and basically what he's saying is that the way we live our life is permeated by suffering. Now that sounds kind of gloom and doom and pessimistic, but the Buddha thought it was just realistic. Uh, in fact, as I've gotten older, I'm thinking, that's so obvious, why did you even have to say it? You know, of course life is full of suffering. But it's because he meant suffering in a very special way that needs to be unpacked. And that's why I want to talk a little bit about it. The word he uses, and I hate to throw out jargon a lot, but this is a very rich word. It's uh, dukkha. That's the word he used. He says life is dukkha. Life as we know it is dukkha. And it's ordinarily translated as suffering, and that's good. It's good as far as a single word goes. Um, but to me, it's too dramatic. I mean, if you think of suffering, it's kind of like being in pain or uh, experiencing tragedy or disasters or, you know, going through grief and all this kind of stuff. I mean, that is suffering, no doubt. But the Buddha meant it in more subtle and insidious ways as well. And this is one of the reasons why I give a whole list of terms to try to give you a sense of what this idea of dukkha is all about. I say it's unease, it's anguish, it's emptiness, sorrow, dissatisfaction. And then the next three or three that I have come up with as I've reflected over this, uh, the others are done by other scholars. But to me, dukkha means ex resistance to reality that is not accepting the way things are, that is one of the things that causes us to suffer. Insatiability, just as I was saying earlier, not being satisfied uh, because there's no end to desire. And then my favorite one is disappointment. Disappointment, I think, greatly encapsulates what I think the Buddha is talking about when he talked about dukkha. And let me give you an example of what I mean. We experience disappointment a lot. But we probably ignore how often we're disappointed during the course of the day. We just kind of let it go because it happens so much. This morning my alarm clock went off at six o'clock. What was my first experience? Disappointment. <laughs> Every morning I start my day with disappointment. I get up. <laughs> now, now I'm back at home, you know. I get up, I drag myself to the bathroom, I turn on the light, I look in the mirror. Major disappointment. <laughs> Go to the kitchen, thinking, okay, at least I can have some grape nuts or some cereal. I'm a big fan of cereal. And I get there and I pour myself a bowl and I go to the refrigerator to get the milk and I find out my daughter's drunk the last bit of milk. More disappointment. You know, it's just one thing after another. And you go to work and your coworker kind of ignores you and doesn't say hello to you. And there are tons of emails you've got to answer. You know what I'm talking about. Now, that's our daily life of course. Uh, we might not think a lot about that because we're so accustomed to it. But the Buddha wanted us to think very carefully. And this is why he made it one of the truths. He said, we suffer a lot. We're disappointed a lot. There is this uneasiness about our life that is just pervasive. And yet, if we think about it too much, we might get a little depressed about it. But he says, this is the place to begin. Let's be realistic. This is the way our lives are. Let's start with this. And so he said this is our first truth. Another reason we don't quite understand it is because we don't really take enough time to look at our lives in this way. We're not introspective enough. We're so busy doing other things. Uh, we are so future-oriented. Uh, and the Buddha himself, remember, did not come to this understanding until after he had practiced meditation and yoga and all this other stuff for six years. So the full reality of dukkha, or any of the Four Noble Truths, is not disclosed until you're completely awakened. And so I tell this to my students to kind of get me off the hook a little bit. I say, if you don't understand the Four Noble Truths, you need to go sit under a tree for six years. And then you'll understand. You know, you don't, don't, don't expect to get it here in this little lecture. Um, basically, what 
that means is that suffering, disappointment, cannot be fully understood until it's completely ended. And there is parallel within Christian theology that says you can't completely understand sin until you receive grace. We don't know the depth of our sin, our estrangement from God, until we've experienced grace in this way. It's the same sort of idea. So it's only at the end you see the depth of uh, how far removed you have been from your potential. So this is what the Buddha said, and I'm quoting here from him. Oh, by the way, I wanted to say these pictures that I gave you earlier are from Buddhist Sunday school literature from Southeast Asia, uh, Burma, Thailand, some from Sri Lanka. Uh, the Buddhists have adopted the Sunday school practice of Christians. Uh, so they go to Sunday school uh, on Sundays, and they create all this literature, just like you know uh, Christians have in their Sunday school classes as well. And so that's why it was all colorful. And uh, someone was asking me about kind of the feminine character of the Buddha. And that's just because he's supposed to look like a very beautiful person. And that's part of the uh, aesthetics of, of South Asia. So this is a quotation right out of the Buddhist text. He says, now this bhikkhu, bhikkhu means monk, is the noble truth of dukkha. Birth is dukkha. Aging is dukkha. Illness is dukkha. Death is dukkha. Now, you probably hear echoes there, those four sights of the Buddha when he was uh, 29 years old. He saw sickness, old age, and death. And now he's talking about it, and he's saying, this is dukkha. And I don't think anybody really would disagree with that. It's so ordinary. Uh, to, to be sick is to suffer in many ways, or uh, to die. Really, the fear of death is suffering, and so forth. He said, union with what is displeasing is dukkha. That is, you know, when you got to let's say you have to go on a date with somebody, it turns out you don't really like them, and you actually got to sit there uh, till the end of dinner, and that's displeasing, <laughs> that's a form of disappointment, or, or having to be with a person or do something you don't like, you know what that's like. Uh, or let's say you like being with someone, you have to leave, you have to depart. Uh, saying goodbye is tough, so separation from what is pleasing is dukkha. Uh, not to get what one wants is to go, oh, that's a great one. You know, of course, you know, you want something, you want it really bad, and you don't get it. That hurts. You know, it hurts. And we try to cover it up, and we try to put on a happy face or make ourselves feel good or go shopping at the mall. That's always a great, great way to try to deal with our dukkha is to, to do something like that. So if you can't get what you want, you go get what you want. Just get something else. In brief, the five aggregates subject to clinging are dukkha. Okay, now that is a really cryptic philosophical phrase, and I'm going to try to unpack this for one reason, and that is because it gives us an understanding, an entree to grasp what the Buddha understands the human person to be. Now, most religions think of human beings as comprising two elements a spirit or a soul, and a body. It's called the body-mind dualism. It runs straight through uh, the Western philosophical tradition. It's adopted by Hinduism. Uh, most Chinese religions uh, believe this sort of thing, that there's an element to us that is immaterial, that is emotional, that uh, thinks uh, as contrasted with our physical natures. Now, we know there's some kind of connection between them. Uh, you know, uh, those two things affect each other, to be sure. But this is the basic way human beings have thought about the nature of human beings for well, at least 4,000 years, I'd say. Not, not before that, but within 4,000 years, we have a soul or a spirit or a mind, whatever you want to call it, this immaterial, intellectual, emotional part, and a body. In Hinduism, at the time of the Buddha, this soul was believed to be immortal. It was the thing that transmigrated. It was the thing that was reborn. And it had existed from time immemorial. There was never a time when the soul, our individual souls, did not exist. And it was the thing that kept coming back to birth over and over again. And liberation in the Hindu tradition came to the point where you have to see that that soul is consubstantial with God, which they call Brahman. That was liberation. Once you could realize your oneness with the totality, 
That was when you got off the cycle of samsara. Well, the Buddha thought about the human self in a very different way. In fact, it is one of his great contributions, I think, to world philosophy and religion. It's really unique, and there's nothing really quite like it. And if I had to name one thing about Buddhism that makes it distinctive from any other religion, it's this. It's his view of the human person. He calls it the five aggregates of being. And what he means is that we're not made up of a body and soul. We're made up of five energies or forces or ever-changing processes that are constantly uh, moving, constantly changing. The first is what he calls these aggregates of being, okay? And this is just who we are. We're made up of these things, these five things that have come together. The first is matter, all right? Now, if you're familiar with chemistry, uh, you know about the uh, periodic table, right? And that's a, that's a great way of thinking about the material world. It's made up of, what is it now, about 110 different elements that come together at various things. And our physical natures are just completely composed of this. There's nothing else. Our physical natures are made up of nothing more than these elements put in various combinations. Well, the Buddha said, we got a material nature. Now, the thing is, uh, that material nature is constantly changing. Uh, it doesn't stay the same from moment to moment, really. Uh, and we can see it, you know, gradually over time as we look in the mirror and see that we're aging or we, we know that people die and, and so forth and bodies decompose. We, we're familiar with this idea that uh, the physical nature is constantly changing. Uh, the Buddha saw it as changing much more rapidly than, than most people of his time saw it. Uh, just as we today, I think, would think of it that way. You know, the, the body is constant. Cells are dying. Millions of cells are dying just as we sit here and they're being reborn constantly. We are constantly changing our influx. We also have sensations or feelings, like somebody having a headache. Uh, I think that's what that kind of represents. Or what we just might call experiences. We have perception or what the Buddha or what we would call in, in Western philosophy as apperception, that is to perceive something as something. Uh, so not only do I see certain uh, photons coming you know, at, at my body in this way, uh, I am perceiving these photons as being human beings who are listening to me, just as in this image, you can perceive it as, what do you see it as? Duck or a rabbit, right? Depending on which way. That's. Some of you saw it as, you know, it's kind of like that. Re remember the dress, you know, is it a white and gold dress or a blue and black dress? It's that same sort of thing. That's apperception. Uh, you're seeing something as something. So you, you, we don't just see things. We see it as something. So we, we see it as a rabbit or we see it as a duck, whatever it might be. And that affects the way we experience the life. So some people are going to experience this as a duck, and others are going to experience it as a rabbit, and so forth. That happens every time we uh, experience perception. Then we have what he called mental formations, or desires, intentions, or willing. Okay, This is the source of our karma, that we will something, that we want something, that we choose to act on something. That is the function of will. And then we have something that he called consciousness, which is just the faculty of awareness. Now remember, all of these things are constantly changing, right? Our sensations are constantly changing. You know, you get an itch, you scratch it, it goes away. Uh, your, your tummy rumbles, uh, that might go away. You eat, you know, your body is undergoing all these experiences constantly. Your thoughts are changing from moment to moment. You're thinking different things, in part based upon things that I say. You're constantly changing your consciousness. You're being aware of different things. So all this stuff is in flux. And the Buddha said, this is who we are. And this is all that we are. We are these five energies that have come together. And this comprises what we might call our self. But he uses it, I use it, with quotation marks, scare quotes here, because the Buddha basically said there is no self, there is no soul, there is no spirit. This is his contribution. No soul, 
no self, no enduring sense of identity. Nothing about us stays the same. We are constantly changing. He said, we simply call this the self or the person or the soul as a convenient way of referring to something that's constantly changing. And the metaphor I use to kind of help my students understand this is a river. You know, rivers look like they're stable. They look like they're there. I live on the Mississippi River, and I you know, see it quite often, and I think there's the Mississippi River. But it's not the Mississippi River because it's constantly changing. Heraclitus, you may be familiar with this saying, said you cannot step into the same river twice because it's not the same river. From moment to moment, it's something different because of the flow that's there. The same is true about our human nature, about who we are. Nothing stays the same. And hence, there cannot be an immortal soul that transmigrates over and over again. So this is quite in the face of Hinduism to say that. Let me give you another uh, image to kind of grasp this idea. This was taken in my backyard. I went home one day and I saw this beautiful rainbow all the way across the backyard. I've never seen anything like it. And my daughter, who was about 10 at the time, was so excited. So she said, oh, I can't wait to get to the end of the rainbow. There's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And so she runs out the door and runs over to the end of the rainbow. And what happened? It disappeared. There's no rainbow. There's no pot of gold. There's no leprechauns. There's no Skittles. I mean, there's nothing there. Even the rainbow disappeared. And why did the rainbow disappear? Because a rainbow is made up of conditions, of certain things that have to be kind of situated in just the right way. And once those things change, it's not there. So it requires, you know, droplets of water. It requires being in a certain physical position. It requires light coming in from a certain direction. You change any one of those things and it disappears. But we think that it's real because I took a picture of it. It looks real, right? It looks real, but it's only made up of conditions. And that's the way we are. Now, the Buddha's not saying we're not real, and he's not saying we don't exist. He's saying we don't exist the way we think we do. We're just not a soul and a body. Now, we are this constant flux. We are like a rainbow. We are like uh, a river or a stream. That's how we are. Now, interestingly, uh, neuroscience has pretty much endorsed the Buddhist idea in the last 25 years. Most neuroscientists and a lot of other philosophers deny the existence of a self. You can go on and list all kinds of TED Talks and things about this. Uh, they're coming at it from a different perspective uh, than the Buddha did. He certainly didn't have access to neuroscience. But as I like to tell my psychologist friends, I've said, I'm really glad to see that psychology is finally catching up with the Buddha. You know, he had this idea 2,500 years ago, and uh, the, the science is now supporting this notion in this way. So I just want to make this clear about what it was that the Buddha sees as the self, okay? And we'll probably come back to it a little bit later on. I'll give you an opportunity to ask some questions. But I want to sum up this first noble truth this way, which is that disappointment and dissatisfaction, suffering, dukkha, whatever you want to call it, pervade our life as we know it. And we suffer far more than we ordinarily realize. Okay, truth number one. Uh, let me see if this works. Hang on. Have you ever heard of the onion you know the onion? Okay, the onion did a little spoof on this. Now, they didn't call it dukkha in the news, um, but I did. And I'll see if this will, will play. I'm not getting any sound. I'm sorry. Let's see. I'm afraid I'm going to have to skip that one. So sorry about that. It's way... At least I have this stuff. I'm so glad about that. Let's talk about truth number two. Now this, monks, is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. It is this craving. You see I've got that highlighted. Craving. The word is tanha, which means thirst. It's this thirst that leads to rebirth accompanied by delight and lust. Seeking delight here and there. 
that is craving for sensual pleasures, craving for existence, craving for non-existence. Now, this is all from the first sermon of the Buddha. He goes in other parts of his discourse to kind of explain what this is, and I'm going to try to unpack it using uh, other parts of his teaching. But you can see clearly that what he sees at the base of the suffering, the disappointment we experience, is this craving. Okay, And that is one of the basic causes of it. So let's talk about it. He really breaks this down, and this will make it a lot easier for us, into three things. There are three proximate causes of dukkha. One is, uh, well, I'll just go ahead and uh, give them. The first one is selfish desire uh, or greed or infatuation. It's wanting things selfishly. Now, desire in itself is not a problem. We can desire to be enlightened, for instance. We can desire to help others. It's when that desire becomes selfish, when it's centered on something that doesn't really exist, basically, and i got to have these things. That's when it becomes problematic. All right. So selfish desire, greed, infatuation, he'll call it lust, calls it different things, but they're all part of the same variety. I want this. i got to have that. The other thing is the flip side of this, which if you think about it, it's really the same thing. It's aversion or hatred. It's like, I don't want this. I got to get away from this. That's desire of a different sort. You know, I'm with someone I don't want to be with. Let me out of here. Uh, pushing things away. Uh, this looks like my daughter. It's not my daughter, but she is a very picky eater. So uh, I put things in front of her oftentimes, and she's very aversive to it. Uh, you know, so I'm still working on getting her to be a better Buddhist. Uh, so she'll eat better. And then finally is delusion, which underlies <laughs> hatred and greed. Okay, delusion is the misapprehension of reality. That's the basic problem we have. We're deluded. We don't see things the way they are. Uh, we, well, as you can see in this uh, picture, you know, we, we think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Uh, and we think the world revolves around us. That's another uh, falsehood. You know, I still have a hard time believing that the world does not revolve around me. Uh, I mean, everywhere I look, it seems like the world is around me. You know, it just seems so self-evident. And I act as if that were true. Well, that's a misapprehension. According to the Buddha, the world doesn't revolve around you or anyone else. Uh, and another misapprehension we have is that there's something permanent in life, that there are things that we can hold on to and they won't disappear, they won't dissolve, they won't leave us. That is another illusion. And all of these things are what is at base of our selfishness and our aversion. We want things because we think if I have that thing, it's going to fulfill us. And that is a total delusion. It's just not going to do it. You know, the, the Buddha is a good example. He had it all, and it wasn't satisfying to him. So desire is a fundamental problem in Buddhism, but it's not really desire. Uh, but it leads to things that are problematic. Here's pro some of the problems with desire. As I said, it's not all desire. It's selfish desire. But part of the problem is we don't know what's going to make us happy. Uh, I ask my students, this, you know, what do you want in life? Oh, I want to be happy. What's it going to take to do that? Well, they just you know, spout out the usual stuff. I'll get a good job. I'll get married. I'll get a house. And then I die, I guess. I don't know. Um, well, I say, well, I'm here to tell you that ain't going to make you happy. Uh, and I tell them the story of getting my PhD, you know, the thing I thought I wanted so much in life uh, and worked so hard to get. And once I got it, I went into a six-month depression. Uh, it was the most disappointing experience of my life, was getting a PhD, because I had invested it with so much happiness. I thought, oh, this is going to make me happy. And what, you know, one day I don't have a doctorate, the next day I have the doctorate and I'm the same guy. I still feel, you know, inadequate. I still feel like a loser, even though I got this PhD. You know, it just didn't fulfill me. Uh, and I've had all kinds of episodes like that. Cars, for instance. I uh, thought, oh, that's going to make me happy. And it did, you know, for a few days. Uh, but that's, that's about it. So what happens is we basically misidentify 
the solution to this problem. We want to be happy. We don't know how to do it. Uh, and what we do is basically what our culture tells us to do. And in this culture, our basic approach is acquisition. The basic way to be happy is to get what you want, to go out and get it. If it's a degree, uh, if it's a, a car, if it's a house, if it's a spouse, if it's a relationship. For me, it was always experiences. Uh, I was never too materialistic, but I wanted to do everything. Uh, this is one of the reasons I traveled all around the world. I wanted to have every experience imaginable. Well, that's a kind of craving. Uh, and, and they're fun and they're good, but it's, it just doesn't provide you with that lasting thing that you want. So we make all kinds of things these objects of our desires. And you know them. You know, wealth, fame, uh, or infamy, infamy if you can't get fame, power, experiences, people, beliefs, uh, non-existence. Uh, Freud talked about the Thanatos, uh, the idea that we might desire not to live. You know, and the Buddha experienced most of these things, and he found them wanting. So that's part of the problem with desire. Uh, one of my favorite quotations in his sermons is that were there a mountain made of gold, double that would not be enough to satisfy a single man. Know this and live accordingly. I saw this uh, magazine advertisement for Office Max. I love this guy. The more success I want, the more I achieve. I thought about that. Why do you want more success if you've got success? And that's because success isn't enough. It's not enough. So you've got to have more and more of this success. And see how happy he is about this. But I know just deep down he's miserable as he can be. <laughs> so as I say, we can't get enough of what we don't really want. Because we don't really want these things uh, that we think we do, that we think are going to make us happy. That's what the Buddha says. We, we misidentify what it is that's going to make us happy. Now, here's the problem with desire, and I'll tell you why it doesn't work. Desire in itself is not a problem. Uh, we all have desires, you know, and desire just means I want that, okay? I want that. That's fine. But almost surreptitiously, almost in an imperceptible way, that desire can easily morph into craving. And we're not aware of this. Uh, it says, we go from saying, I want this to I must have that. And then that craving gets even more intensified when it becomes attachment or thirst. And so that's where you go from, I must have that, to if I do not get it, I will die. This is the pattern of addiction, if you've ever known that. And I know it very well. You start off, nobody starts off saying, hey, I think I'll become an addict. <laughs> they don't start off that way. Uh, they just start off with this desire that slowly and slowly and slowly builds up. And then one day you realize you're an addict. My first experience with addiction was when I was living in Boston, and I got addicted to nose spray. Did you know you could get addicted to nose spray? Okay, well, in Boston, you get colds all the time, and I got the nose spray, and so I was using it for three or four weeks. And then I found out when I wasn't using it, my membranes would sort of enlarge, and it felt like I was going to choke to death, and I couldn't breathe. And I remember driving around in Boston, uh, feeling, you know, my, my nose getting stopped up, and I reached over for my nose spray, and it was empty. And I started freaking out because I thought, oh, I'm going to suffocate. And so I'm driving all over Boston, you know, look, looking for a drugstore, uh, driving like a maniac, which was okay because everybody in Boston drives like a maniac. But then I finally found the store, you know, grocery store. Uh, drugstore. I ran in, found the, 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 the nose spray aisle, grabbed a box, ran there, plopped down my five dollars, ripped open the box, <laughs> and snorted that stuff right there. It was blessed relief. Oh, God. And then I thought, I've got a problem. <laughs> you know, this is the first time I've realized this kind of thing happened. Well, I never started down this path. So. But that was attachment. And a, a good term for attachment is addiction. And we're all addicted to things. You know, we don't really know about it. Uh, but we all are, in some ways, addicted, not just to substances. Those are, in some ways, the easiest things to get up. Uh, we, we get addicted to people. 
and beliefs and ideas and things that we must have. That's all just part of what we are. And that, according to the Buddha, is what causes us to suffer. Because attachment means we've got to have something. But the way the world is, is that it's constantly in flux. So you cannot be attached to anything that is subject to change. So I guess it would be all right if I was addicted to nose spray and I had an endless supply of nose spray. You know, the problem is I don't. And when I don't have it, I suffer. Okay, so... Uh, like this little cartoon, this guy's holding on to a rock. He says, my stone. I don't want to give up my stone. It's not much, but it's mine. I can't live without my stone. On the other hand, you know, and there he is. He's dying because he's got to hang on to that stone. That atta that's attachment. And sometimes we get attached to things and refuse to give them up because they're so comfortable. Uh, you know, this is the way it is. This is the way it's always been. I don't want to change. Uh, giving up your addictions is a hard, hard thing to do. But that's precisely what the Buddha says. Got to give them up. Okay? So here's the problem with attachment. It's not supported by reality. Okay? The world is different than our attachments. So we're at odds with the world because we want the world to be a certain way. We want the world to revolve around us. We want the world to make us happy. And yet it doesn't. Okay? So, noble truth number two, disappointment, dissatisfaction arise because we fail to apprehend the nature of reality, especially ourselves. Okay? We don't see things the way they are. Which takes us to the third truth, which is the fact that we can end this. This is the great news from the Buddha. If I were to say the Buddha had great news, good news, a gospel, it would be this. You don't have to suffer. Suffering is not necessary. And so he talked about the cessation of dukkha, and he used the word nirvana, or nibbana, to talk about it. Now, you'll notice I'm using two different words closely related. The word in parentheses is in Sanskrit, but the words that the Buddhists use and that the Buddha himself spoke is Pali. It's a different word, a different language, very similar to Sanskrit. And so most Buddhists call it nibbana. We in the West know it as nirvana. Okay, so it's the same thing, and even Hindus use that term. Nibbana means to blow out, a strange sort of word, uh, but that's what it literally means. And when Westerners first started encountering and studying Buddhism in the 19th century, they thought, what a terrible religion. You know, they want to blow themselves out. You know, why don't you just kill yourself? I thought it was very pessimistic. But what the Buddha was saying is, no, what we blow out, is this illusion of our self. That's what we let go. We blow out these flames of desire that cause us to suffer. That's why he used this term. And whenever I think of blow out, I always think of birthday cakes, and blowing out the candles. And this is so good because for me, whenever I think of birthday cakes, I think of happy birthday. You know, getting sung happy birthday to. And, um, Happiness is what the Buddha called this. Nirvana is happiness. All right? It's blowing out this candle, this fire that keeps us going, keeps us desiring, keeps us suffering. Nibbana is not a state, not a place, not an experience. It's not like heaven. You don't go there. Uh, people had asked that to the Buddha. He said, well, you blow a candle out, where does it go? You know, it doesn't go anywhere. So he basically refused to talk about what Nibbana was. But he just says, basically, it's not a place. It's not a state of being. It's not really even an experience. Okay. Tropicana did this ad a couple of years ago. Actual photo of a woman in Nirvana. No wonder it's America's favorite grapefruit juice. Okay, there we go. Make it a little easier there. Don't have to worry about all this giving up of attachments and ending desires. Just have a Tropicana grapefruit juice. Well, this is great, uh, except like so many ads, it's totally wrong. Uh, you can't be in Nirvana. You can't be having this experience. What she's experiencing is pleasure, which is not happiness. It is not this contentment. Okay, she's experienced pleasure. Uh, 
And uh, I always wondered what she's doing with a glass of grapefruit juice out in the mountains. I mean, who, who does that? Who carries a, a tumbler with grapefruit juice as they're uh, traveling around? But there is one aspect of this that is right, and that's the bottom word, perfect, because that's what the Buddha said. It's perfect. Nibbana is reaching that which we are all capable of. It's actualizing our potential. Okay? It's just not done in this manner. He said, it's the extinction of desire, cessation of thirst, destruction of illusion, elimination of the self. Not the elimination of self, the elimination of the illusion of the self. Because remember, the self isn't real, but we give up that illusion. When we give up that illusion, we stop thinking that the world revolves around us. We eradicate our ignorance, and we end our rebirth. So all this sounds negative, you know, destruction, cessation, uh, extinction. And it contributed to this idea that Westerners had that this was not a, a pleasant sort of thing. But they didn't understand it. it is a, it's a very optimistic religion. I mean, I think about this, giving up desire. That's what I want. You know, I think that is the, the formula to happiness. It's not to get what I want. It's to want what I've got. You know, it's, it's changing this. It's a whole different perception. He also talked about it in other terms. I won't go through all of this stuff. Uh, you know, called it the, the stable, the peace, the marvelous, you know, all these things. It really doesn't tell us much about it. And the reason for that is you can't say much about it. Language does not capture this. So in this way, Buddhism is kind of mystical close to people like Pseudo Dionysius and Meister Eckhart and all of these mystics uh, from the uh, Desert Fathers and Mothers who said, you know, we cannot discuss this mystery. It's beyond our language, so it's better not even to talk about it. And oftentimes, as people come up to the Buddha and ask him questions. He just refused to answer it. Uh, one of these is like, where did the universe come from? Now, we think that's an important question. Uh, and so... Christians sort of say, well, the universe came from God. The Buddha said, I'm not going to answer it. I'm not going to tell you if it was created or not created. I'm just not going to answer it. And the reason I'm not going to answer it is because it's not important to know. It has no effect on your daily life. You will still be suffering whether you know the answer or not. You know, that's his focus. Suffering and the end of suffering. Getting rid of the dukkha. Knowing the answer to metaphysical issues not a concern. This is why I think he didn't teach rebirth. Uh, it's just, that's just speculation. And the Buddha was saying, don't speculate. Focus on the here and now. And this is why I think Buddhism is, is so compatible with different religions. So I think you could easily be a Buddhist uh, Christian if you wanted to, uh, because Buddhism does not say you have to believe certain things. If you want to believe in God, I think that's fine. Uh, if you don't want to believe in God, that's fine too. The Buddha does not prescribe belief. He just says, these are the practices. This is what we do to end our suffering. And you'll even see that some of the things that he talks about in terms of ending selfishness is very much akin to what Jesus said or what Confucius said or any of the great sages. You know, it's like that. There are different types of Nibbana. I said uh, he gained one nirvana when he was awakened and he had a second nirvana at his death. And that was when he just extinguished all of his past karmas and he just, well, all, what the Buddha says, is he's gone. He's just gone. They don't speculate on where he went uh, or even say that he went anywhere. So, to sum, one need not develop unhealthy attachments, Dissatisfaction, disappointment, and suffering are therefore not necessary, and dukkha is optional. And so the question is, how do I get this wonderful thing? And the next truth is about that, how you find the way to nirvana. Uh, it's called the Eightfold Noble Path, and this is the uh, image that's often used to talk about it. Uh, it looks like a ship's wheel. Uh, but each one of those represents uh, uh, one path on what is really a, a single path. So I've got 1144. How much time do I have? 20 minutes? Okay, good. I can get us pretty far down this path in 20 minutes, but it will take you a lifetime to take it. <laughs> okay, so again, I want to emphasize it's not a 
a, a belief system. This path is not doctrine, not creed. It's a practice, something that you do. And uh, the first thing you do is try to see that the noble truths are, in fact, true. And then you verify it for yourself. And if you're able to verify it for yourself, then you experience this nirvana. Okay. So uh, the goal is to put an end to these three fires that I talked about. Selfish desire, aversion, and delusion. That's what this path tries to do. Uh, I'm going to simplify it a little bit uh, and talk about them in uh, three categories rather than each one of them. Uh, here's what they all look like. You may have seen something like this, but you know, right understanding, right concentration, right thought, right mindfulness. The right mindfulness and concentration is what we talked about this afternoon. Uh, effort, action, and so forth. These are all things that kind of go together and they mutually enforce each other and you can't do one without the other. So you can't just meditate and find nirvana. You have to practice these other things as well. And so the categories that I like to use are wisdom, conduct, and awareness. I'm going to flip through this stuff pretty quickly here. Uh, the first thing is try to get a basic understanding of what it was that the Buddha was saying, what the Dhamma is. And I've been providing you with some of that and talking about what Dukkha is. But talking about it's not enough. You've got to see it for yourself uh, and practice these sorts of things. But you've got to start somewhere. And you start with an understanding, kind of a, a book learning, as my grandfather used to call it. Learn it from the book, but then you've got to have the real-life experience. Uh, one of the first things that you do, uh, and you do all this stuff at the same time, but this is the way it kind of unfolds in the basic life of a Buddhist, and I'm thinking of a child sort of growing up, is teaching the child virtues, uh, which is called right intention. And these are qualities like non-attachment, not getting attached to things, trying not to get addicted to things, practicing friendliness, practicing compassion, uh, which is a very important virtue in Buddhism. That's what this is about, how to treat others uh, as you yourself would want to be treated. And part of what that does is to decenter this sense that we're at the center of the universe. So by practicing compassion, you're recognizing there are other people in the world, and they have the same feelings that I do. And so maybe being this self-centered person isn't altogether true, and it helps to kind of unleash that attachment that we have to the self. And then here are uh, the things that fall under the category of conduct. And I think these are really important. I'm going to talk about them. It's called the uh, right action, uh, which I divide into five precepts. By the way, the, uh, the Buddhists just love numbers. Five, you know, four noble truths, the three kalashas, the uh, five precepts. The reason for that is because the tradition was kept orally for 500 years before anything was ever written down, and putting things in this numbered system helped them to memorize it, okay, so they could talk about these things. It's the same way with like the Ten Commandments. You ever wonder why there are Ten Commandments? Not 12 or 8 or 15, as Mel Brooks thinks, uh, you know, why that? It's because it's easier to remember these ten. So, We'll talk about these five precepts, uh, which are recited in Buddhist countries by every child in school. So you know how we have Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, in these traditional Buddhist countries, you go to school, the first thing you do is to recite in Pali, in this original text, these precepts. And here they are. I promise, and this is just a promise, it's not a commandment from God, it's just saying I'm endeavoring to do this. I'm endeavoring to not hurt other beings, sentient beings, beings that feel. Uh, and that includes animals and bugs and gods and all orders of being. It just says, I'm not going to do that. And uh, perhaps the best exemplar of this, of course, is Gandhi, who adopted it from the Jains, who adopted it from the Buddhists. So that's where it came down. It was also adopted by the Hindus, this idea of not hurting living beings no matter what, because they feel the same way we do. And so there's this sense of empathy that gives rise to compassion in Buddhism. And all the other precepts here follow along this idea of not hurting others. Now, interestingly, you would assume, based on this, that Buddhists are vegetarians, right? But they're not, um, at least not for the most part. Many of them are. 
the Dalai Lama is not. A lot of people are always surprised by that. He loves to eat things called momos, which are these meat dumplings. And his followers say, you know, hey, Dolly, you, you know, you ought to give up the meat and be a vegetarian, but he loves them too much. The, the point is, you don't kill the meat yourself. As long as somebody else does it, it's their bad karma, not <laughs> yours. And, and, and so the, the Hindus are the same way. If you go to India... The butchers in India are Muslims, okay? Because they have no problem with this. But the Hindus, and there are still some Hindus who do eat meat, particularly the lower caste, they eat meat that's been butchered by the Muslims, okay? Yeah. So, interesting way to get around it. But um, that, that's it. And, and maybe the Buddha himself was a, a meat eater. We're not really sure uh, about that. So, but practicing non-harming, first thing to abstain from that which is not offered, which is kind of a fancy way of saying don't steal anything. Uh, and so what it means is even if you find something on the ground uh, and it's not yours, you shouldn't take it. So I was confronted with this a couple of years ago. I found a $100 bill on the ground in a grocery store, and I looked around, you know, maybe not too hard, but I, I did look around, you know, and, I didn't see anybody, and I didn't know what to do. And I, I really wanted to follow this precept, and so I thought a lot about it. What am I going to do with this? I thought, well, I could go into the grocery store and give it to the grocery manager. Uh, but then I thought about the grocery manager, whom I knew pretty well, and I thought, no, he's just going to pocket it. Uh, so, and I didn't want to go to the trouble of putting an ad in the paper. I mean, uh, these people calling me up, hey, I understand you got my $100 bill. Well, can you identify that? You know, it, so I ended up giving it to uh, a charity, uh, which I thought was the, the, the best solution to that problem. I didn't know how else to deal with it. But uh, Buddhists go to great lengths like this. You know, I'm telling you, my, my wife, who really practices ahimsa, I mean, she's vegetarian and all this stuff, she doesn't want to kill mosquitoes. And one night when my daughter was just an infant, a mosquito got into our house. And my wife thought, oh, my God, that mosquito's carrying West Nile. Uh, you know, so she said, you've got to get rid of that mosquito. Why me? <laughs> you know, that's what I'm to say. But she woke me up. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, and, and we were in a fairly large bedroom, and I turned on the lights, and I spent an hour looking for the damn mosquito. <laughs> and I finally found it, and I captured it in a, a glass, and took it outside and released it. Yeah, exactly. So it made her happy. And I, I guess I was able to sleep better uh, after that. So but that, that's, the, that's the extent to which a serious Buddhist will go, you know, when it comes to ahimsa. So. To abstain from sexual misconduct. Uh, most Buddhist monks and nuns are celibate, but not all. Uh, depends upon the tradition, but those who are married are expected to stay faithful to their spouses. As this uh, billboard indicates that someone did not, uh, if you can read it, this was an actual billboard in New York City. Uh, and the reason, again, is that sexual misconduct causes harm. It also causes attachment, you know, so there are all kinds of problems uh, connected to that. Uh, to abstain from false speech, which means not to lie. Oh, this reminds me of another story. I, I hate to digress because I'm going to lose time, but I want to tell you the story because my daughter, she gives me so much material. So we spend a lot of time uh, dealing with theology, and she used to go to an Episcopal girls' school, and, you know, they teach her how to pray and all that stuff. So she got into this habit of praying, and I asked her to tell me about how she prayed. And she said, well, i tell you what I do. You know, sometimes I'll tell God, if he does something for me, I won't do something else. Or, you know, uh, I promise something in return. Kind of a quid pro quo, which is actually the way the Hindus do it. And, uh, or, or she'll say, if, if you do this for me, I will never ask for anything else again. Okay, have you ever done that prayer? <laughs> Lord, please help me get out of this drunken state, and I will never take another drink. Something like that. And I said, well... Don't you pray for the same thing sometimes? She said, yeah, I do, but I cross my fingers when I'm praying. <laughs> <laughs> so
So she's lying to God, <laughs> thinking that God doesn't uh, see her, you know, when this is going on. And I got a lot of work cut out for myself with, uh, with her theology. But she's really pretty good at, at most of that kind of stuff. It's just kind of amusing. Um, and then finally, to abstain from stupefying drink. I tell my students, I said, I, I, I took this picture over at the uh, ATO house for Saturday night, <laughs> and I, I'm sure it looks like that. Uh, so uh, stupefying drink is not good for mindfulness, essentially. You know, it's kind of hard to see the world as it is when you're looking through the bottom of a beer bottle. Uh, that's the idea here. So many Buddhists just abstain completely. But ironically, and, and this is just, I guess, part of religion everywhere you go. You know, there's more pornography in this Christian country than there is anywhere else in the world, uh, despite the Christian ethics. Uh, but in Southeast Asia and uh, Sri Lanka and places like this, it has the highest per capita rate of alcohol consumption of other places in the world. And yet... Every day, people will go. I've got a friend who's a bartender. He, he recites the uh, refraining from stupefying drink every day. And then every night, he's mixing drinks and drinking them. You know, it's just people don't always follow their ideals, I guess. Uh, that's, that's what I can say. But the reason behind this, of course, is to kind of keep our minds clear and to eliminate the tendency towards distraction uh, or attachment. Okay. So let me continue on with conduct. Another one is speech. Uh, right speech, which means to speak correctly, uh, to speak gently, using wholesome speech, uh, not yelling, not cursing. Uh, and if you can't do that, to observe noble silence. Or as the Muslims say, uh, open your mouth, only what you're going to say is more beautiful than silence. You like that one? Yeah, it's nice. I'll go back to it there. Open your mouth, only if what you're going to say is more beautiful than silence. Yeah. And then right livelihood, which says, you know, you've got to do your work in a way that doesn't harm beings. So uh, your work ought to be legal and honest. You do it peacefully. You do it without harming others. The Buddha specifically proscribed things like dealing in arms, selling arms, uh, <laughs> human trafficking or selling living beings, uh, butchery, poisons, intoxicants. Uh, soothsaying that is predicting the future, and usury. Everybody know what usury is? That's not a, you do know what usury is. Oh, good. My, my students don't know what it is. Uh, so, but he forbade that. So that's how you ought to live your life. And then you practice what's called right effort, and that is to kind of develop a, a calm, serene mind. Uh, if you're like me, you have a lot of negative thoughts. Well, the Buddha taught all kinds of wonderful techniques to relax those negative thoughts, to encourage wholesome thinking, uh, and again, as you can see, this all takes time. It's all part of the process. Uh, you know, people have these negative thoughts that oftentimes lead to negative actions. That was the Buddha's concern. So he would say things like, if you feel greedy, uh, have a thought of non-attachment. Take an action of generosity. And this is a way of counteracting that. You know, when you're feeling greedy, give something away. How much time do I have? I got another story. Okay. So, you know, I go all over the world and I one day just started collecting Buddhas. I thought this would be a nice thing to have in my home. So and I finally found one I just really loved. Uh, I think it was from Burma. Beautiful Buddha. And I paid a well for me it was a lot of money, two hundred bucks. And uh, I was giving a talk at a church. And I had that Buddha there, you know, right there, and talking about it. And, um, and by the way, let me, let me talk about Buddha images and things like that. The reason I show you lots of pictures is because Buddhism and Hinduism are very visual religions. You go to the temple to see the gods, or you go to a temple to see the image of the Buddha because they, those images teach us the Dhamma. That's important. In Christianity and Judaism and Islam, you go to hear things. The, the focus is upon listening. That's why you go hear a sermon or you hear the word of God spoken. But it's seeing in the South Asian culture. And so I put the image of this 
fancy Buddha that I had with me, and I thought that was going to help me teach the Dhamma, but really, I was just damn proud of it. And uh, I was kind of wanting people to get jealous of it, and look at me, I got this great Buddha. And a friend of mine uh, came up afterwards, he says, Mark, that is just the most beautiful Buddha I've ever seen. I said, well, thank you, John, I, I really like it, it is nice. Um, I'll see you later. And I picked it up, and you know, was going back to the car, and my wife stopped, and she says, you know what you got to do, don't you? I said, what? you got to give that image to John. <laughs> what? <laughs> My $200 book. And I knew. It didn't take me more than five seconds to know that's exactly what I had to do. Uh, but here I'm teaching about a teacher who taught non-attachment, and I was getting attached to the teacher. So the next day I drove over to John's house and I presented him with that Buddha. It was, the, it was really one of the happiest moments of my life to give that up like that. So that was uh, my story with the Buddha. And so I replaced my greed with generosity. Um, and generosity doesn't come easy for me. Okay, there are other things you can do, you know, like, you know, when you're thinking about things, you reflect on the results. Do I really want to, that slice of cheesecake? Bill, uh, I was just got to, I mean, when you're experiencing something like envy, uh, another negative thought, you're thinking, you, you can ask yourself, you know, why do, why do I think I need this? You know, <laughs> why do I need that? Why am I envying this person? That one's always very helpful to me, you know, to do that, or to think about all the great things that I have, so. Uh, and then, this is what we're going to talk about this afternoon, so I'm going to stop it at this point. It's right mindfulness. We'll get back to that and talk about it and do a little practice. But now, I think, it's, is it lunchtime? Or is there anything you need to say? Oh, okay. I'm, yeah, great. Questions? Yeah. Certainly. Far away. I'm not accustomed to talking so long. You know, when I'm in class, I, the students are always conversing back and forth with me. So this is an odd sort of situation. So when you were talking about finding the $100, yeah. um, I was thinking about the difference between the cookie jar and the $100. I think there's a difference. So you, you found that. Yeah. You didn't envy it, you didn't seek it, right. you didn't take it from anyone. Right. The cookie jar, you could argue, belongs to someone else or yeah. it's someone else's to give out. Exactly. So I felt like there was a difference because yeah. my sons once on a scuba diving uh, venture found money that had obvious in the ocean that had fallen from a tourist pocket while swimming. And we enjoyed that money. <laughs> they, they, they bought us a bottle of wine that evening on the boat, you know. Yeah. And <laughs> so I just was thinking about, and I don't know if I'm just rationalizing it away, but, <laughs> you know, the difference between the what cookie I was, and yeah, the Yeah, I understand. What I was trying to illustrate was the way that the Buddha put this, to abstain from that which is not offered. He didn't say, don't steal. He says, don't take anything that doesn't belong to you or something that somebody hasn't given to you. And so basically, I think from one Buddhist perspective, I could have just as easily left there and not done anything because it wasn't offered to me. And it, it was intended to illustrate the, the length to which a lot of people will go to avoid the kind of attachment that might come. So just as the child wasn't being offered those cookies but was thinking about taking them, I wasn't being offered a hundred dollars. Uh, but I did want to sort of deal with it in a, a an ethical sort of way. That was the difference. Uh, yeah. Turn it on. Christians have churches, and we all know what goes on in the church. Yeah. Buddhists have temples. Right. What do they do in there? That is a very good question. Uh, 
Well, usually a temple is occupied by a monk or a nun or a group of monks and nuns. There's no, well, they, the monks and nuns are clergy. There are no priests, there are no ministers in Buddhism. Uh, monks and nuns don't perform weddings and things like that. Uh, they are there to teach the Dhamma and to kind of follow their own path. Ultimately, I think all Buddhists will, at some point in their lifetimes, uh, future lifetimes, become a monk or nun so that they can find Nibbana. So what you would do is that uh, the people would come together and it becomes very religious. And it, in some ways, is very different from what I think the Buddha would approve of. Uh, they, they offer flowers to the Buddha image or incense to the Buddha image. Many people pray to the Buddha uh, as if he were a god. They recite uh, these precepts or what are called gatas and things like that. Most Buddhists do not meditate, uh, interestingly enough. They think it's too exotic or too difficult. Even most monks don't meditate. But it's one thing that the Buddha himself said was uh, very important. Yeah, I can probably hear you. I'll, I'll repeat what you said. I want to follow up. Yeah. There's, there's not then a service, so to speak, mm. where all the people go at one time. Well, you can go at any time. That's what I was saying. In the United States, people, Buddhists have kind of adopted Sunday because everybody's usually off from work. And so they will go on a Sunday and uh, do what's called a puja, which is kind of this offering of incense, very much like a Hindu uh, service. But it's not on any particular day. Uh, there's usually, well, there's the, the chanting, but not singing of hymns. Uh, there could be prayers, that sort of thing. Is, uh, there, is there a leader? The, that would be the monk. That would be the monk or the nun. Uh, there are no pews. That's what I was going to ask. That's a problem. Uh, it, <laughs> it, you got to sit on the floor. Could you say? Could you say it was the difference in Christians going to Sunday morning eleven o'clock, and a Christian going Friday afternoon at three thirty mm -hmm. and just sitting in the pew by himself? Absolutely, it okay. could be like most temples are open any time. People can go in and do whatever they want. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of that though comes from Christianity. Christianity's had this because it's international, has had this profound effect on other traditions. So as I was saying earlier, Buddhists have adopted the Christian Sunday school. Uh, and um, that's just one instance of that. Anyone else? Hi. Yes. I'm Constance, and I'm enjoying your lecture so much. Thank you. Uh, would you mind going back to that slide that talked about um, it showed the poem, the rights about right speech, not that one, the one with the right speech. And oh, there, that one. Oh, that one. Yes, please. Can I? Do you want to copy that? Yeah, I would love a copy of that. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is going to be posted online, okay. so you can um, find who, it. There. Can you read it out to me, it please? It says, "Open your mouth, mm -hmm. only if what you are going to say is more beautiful." Then silence. And that was a proverb, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now there's a Zen version of this that I like too. Um, open mouth, already a mistake. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, is there any other questions? Right here? Okay. Go ahead. Here you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I told you earlier that my sister-in-law is Buddhist, mm -hmm. and she does eat meat. Um, mm -hmm. And I noticed that we were in Maine uh, one time on a vacation, and her daughter wanted to, had never had lobster. lobster. Yes. And so, you know, the lobsters are live, and they're in a tank, and... <laughs> Her daughter, Emma, is not going to kill the lobster herself, but I noticed that Ashley, her mother, gave her a very stern look and said, you need to pray over this, and this is your decision, and whatnot. And Emma decided, I want the lobster. 
And so she enjoyed it. Um, but don't you think that's somewhat of a contradiction? Because, um, like, for example, my husband is a hunter. Mm. And um, I also agree with not harming yeah. animals and things like that. But he's also an environmentalist wow. and very conscious about animals. And then we would eat all of the meat and use all of the parts of the animal. Um, what do you think about that contradiction? I think it's an interesting question to ask right before we go into lunch. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I used to live in Maine for six years. And I struggled with this, you know, because I love lobster too. <laughs> and, you know, you got to put them in. And, and so people would say, don't worry about it because lobsters don't have nervous systems. Okay, which is true. And so they can't feel pain. But they should sure make a ruckus inside that boiling pot. Uh, so it makes me think that may not be true. It's, it's a tough question. And here's the way I think about it. We can't avoid killing. You, you know, uh, we still kill plants, and, and we still accidentally step on bugs, and, and, and things die. And, and there's really no way to avoid injuring other things. But what I can do is become aware of what I'm doing and try to minimize the harm that I'm doing and to appreciate the kind of interconnectedness there is in life and to uh, approach it in kind of this way of like the Native Americans do praying before they like will butcher a, a deer or something like that and recognize that you know this is a sacred event and I think the ancients were much more attuned to this than we are you know uh, in, in the old days in you know the old Roman Empire I mean all meat was sacrificial meat this is why Paul is, is got a problem with it, you know, because they sacrifice it to the gods and they thought that was a problem and said it's better not to eat that meat. But, uh, you know, it's, it's always a compromise, I guess. And, and it, for me, it, it, to, to think about this is to just simply be aware of the consequences of my action, even if it means that some things, you know, do lose their life. Okay. I don't know if that helps. It's a, it's a troubling no, it sort of thing. I just, yeah. you know, because a lot of hunters or people yeah. who are uh, living in the wilderness, right. for example, they have to eat to avoid starvation. Yeah. And usually if they find an animal and they need to kill it so that they can survive, they usually give a blessing and yeah. thank you so much exactly. for this and, and things of that nature. So, yeah. I think when it's done in that way, it's, it, it's at least better. And if we buy hamburger meat at the store or yeah. eggs at the store, for example, those animals have suffered tremendously. Yeah. yeah. I have a friend who's a Jain. Now, Jainism is a religion very close to Buddhism, but it's much more extreme. And uh, Jains will not kill anything. They're strict vegetarians. And I mean, they really take it to uh, its far extremes. And, and Jain uh, monks and nuns, they wear a mask over their face all the time so they don't accidentally inhale a gnat or they brush the uh, <laughs> sidewalk so they don't accidentally step on a bug. You know? I make my husband kill the roaches. <laughs> <laughs>